Welcome to Careless Coder. Today we're going to play with radioactive isotopes and make a true random number generator on the Commodore 64. What is the worst that can happen when I play with radioactive isotopes? So radioactive isotopes, they're actually very useful and not as dangerous as people may make it seem. Uh, a common misunderstanding for example is uranium because it has a very long half-life, like 4 billion years and people are oh, it takes forever to decay. Well that's a good thing because stuff that has a short uh, half-life is far more dangerous because you have to see it this way if you have this much energy being released in four billion years it's far less dangerous than if you have the same amount of energy this much and that's being released in say 12 hours like technician 99 that they will inject into your veins to image uh, heart and lung vessels which I have had and I'm still here knock on wood <laughs> So yeah, that is, it's not as dangerous. Now how are we going to generate random numbers with these radioactive isotopes? Well, we basically let a free running timer count up and we're only interested in the lowest bit and as soon as a particle decays, because that is the random stuff, we don't know on a quantum level when a particle will fly off, in this case they are beta particles so as soon as one flies off, we will have it detected with a Kaike counter that in this case detects beta radiation and gamma and x-rays. It will trigger a pulse and then we will look what that lowest bit is. If it's a zero, we shift in a zero. If it's a one, we shift in a one. And we do that eight times and then we have a random number between zero and 255. And that is how we actually do it. It's really, really simple. So I bought the cheapest Kaike counter I could get and I figured every Kaike counter, I have a gamma counter over there, has a interface to plug in external measurement equipment. Uh, this one doesn't. Actually this one doesn't even tick audibly, I think I can hack it that way as well, but I'm just going to actually tap off the LED that will actually count, see if we can actually see that, yep. We will tap that off so we can actually drive a transistor to pull low the flag 2 on the user port. Now the flag 2 is actually a non-maskable interrupt or we can attach a non-maskable interrupt to it. So as soon as it's pulled down an interrupt will happen. We will check the lowest bit on the free running CIA counter. If it's a 0 we shift in a 0, if it's a 1 we shift in a 1. But first we need to hack this. And then we're going to create some true random number gen. Uh, numbers. So let's have a look at this thing. Oh, look at that tiny tube. That is a tiny tube. Usually you want a big tube. These long J321s, but this one is too tiny. It's not very sensitive. You want a big tube. So usually this will beep, but this won't in this case. But we do have this LED that flickers. So I figured I can tap into that LED and bring it outside. So here is the current limiting resistor, R32, that is driven by a, a little transistor on the other side. So I think I can actually tap it off from that resistor. So this is basically the schematic or part of it from the Geiger counter. We have a transistor that if a pulse arises from the microcontroller, it will actually conduct and make this LED light up. And this LED is connected to 3.3 volts. So I will tap into that, put this 1K resistor there that prevents uh, shorting, that in case you short this, that you do not short the battery of the Geiger counter here, the voltage. And this is of course a stereo jack, so I connect both the right and left channels together so you don't get mixed up. And of course the common that we need to share between the Geiger counter, our little circuit, and of course the Commodore's user port. 
So this is simple enough. Now on a breadboard we'll actually create this little schematic. We again have a barrel jack here with both uh, pins connected so we don't mix up where the signal comes from. And that will flow into a uh, 10k resistor as soon as a pulse triggers here. So with that 1k resistor in series is basically an 11k but still enough to actually conduct this NPN transistor and pull low the flag from the user port. And as soon as that is pulled low, we can trigger an interrupt. And that interrupt will check the free running CIA counter, the lowest bit. And if it's a zero, we shift in a zero. If it's a one, we shift in a one. And that's all code. So let's uh, modify the Kaiga counter and build this up on a breadboard. So I attach my 1K resistor to that uh, 300 ohm resistor, I believe it is, R32. Then attach a wire, that wire I soldered to a jack on the output. And a ground, I soldered to a ground pin that was laying around somewhere. And everything is done, close it up. And then we stick a cable into the hole and we test it. Yeah, the LED is blinking with the same rate as the LED in the machine, so we can actually switch a transistor. Now, if you don't have any radioactive isotopes, uh, you can actually buy this stuff, uranium glass. And yes, under my uranium glass bell is actual true uranium ore. And this glass you can buy in thrift stores. So we soldered two wires to the edge connect, the ground and the not flag two. And those are A and B on the edge connector. And when a pulse comes, we pull down the flag two and it will trigger an interrupt. So I soldered the ground and the not CF flag. This is the not CF flag. And that is the ground. And we have another little jack where the blue is the ground and the red is actually the signal that we will trigger the base on a transistor. So what we will use is a tiny transistor, pretty much anyone will work. A little base resistor, although remember that we already have a 1K in series. So this is a 10K, so 11K, that should be fine. So that goes to the base, just to protect the base to collect the current. Right, we hook this one up. the same row. Then we have the emitter and the emitter is this one. So we share that. So we share that here as well. And then we pull the collector of this thing down. So that should then work. So it's connected to the user port, our little digital switch. We have our Geiger counter sitting on some radioactive sources and it should be pulsing now. And for each eight pulses, we should get a digit. Let's load it. And there should be random numbers appearing, 229. 27, look at that. Now if we remove the nuclear source, so it's now gone, it will not generate new numbers. If I add the nuclear source again, we will see the boom. So it takes eight pulses to generate a, uh, well, a digit, a random digit, and if I remove it again, it will wait. Every now and then a pulse will hit, that is uh, cosmic radiation, but that's very, very rare. But if I put this back, so we are on average two pulses per second, so two decays in a second. So it will take about four seconds in that case to generate a number. So real number generators, they are slow. But what you can do is actually use these numbers again as a seat for a pseudo random generator. And of course we can generate this a lot quicker by just putting it 
directly into a nuclear reactor or uh, we'll add some extra radiation to the mix. Let's do that. So let's take all these sources. Uh, we have cobalt 60. We have barium 133. This was a very potent thing, but they're all pretty old. December 2014. And uh, strontium 90. So let's put this all together and it should go a little bit quicker. There we go. It's a bit faster. More radiation, more random numbers. So we have random numbers, true random numbers. Now, if you were, for example, to make a die, you would have an array one, two, three, four, five, six, and you would take this uh, eight bit number, for example, and loop through that uh, die array that many positions and then you also have a random die. So let's have a look at the source code. It's simple enough. We set everything up, we start the timer again and we then jump here indefinitely because it's interrupt driven. So the setup, we clear the screen, we load the configuration of timer B from a CIA and we configure it in such a way with this end instruction that we're going to count clock cycles and we are only interested basically in the lowest bit of uh, that 16-bit clock so here we uh, start it again by uh, oring zero and we're storing it back we set uh, y to zero actually it's not really necessary because it's already configured here as zero i just realized that and i'm seeing it now and here we start the setup of the uh, interrupt so we load the low byte of this interrupt address in interrupt vector low, which in this case is 318. And the high byte in interrupt vector high, that is 319. And then we tell it to react on a non-maskable interrupt for this. So we store that into this interrupt control register and we enable interrupts again. So when a decay happens, this IRQ is triggered. So we save all the registers, very important to always do that with an interrupt handler. Then we load Y from memory here, which is uh, default starts at uh, zero. Then we mask off the lowest bit of that timer B. And if that lowest bit is uh, one, then we jump to here. Shift and add one, and if it's zero, we just do a shift and add nothing. Then we restore the registers, we acknowledge that we had the interrupt, and we return from the interrupt waiting for the next decay. So here we have the restart of the timer. Here we uh, end that uh, lowest bit of the timer to actually get a zero or a one. Here we do the shift and add nothing, so we load that random byte, so we start off with zero and we shift it uh, to the left, so it's basically still zero in that case, if it's a one, we shift it to the left, it will be uh, two. And we prepare for the next bit, this will actually check if we already had eight counts, and in that case we know that we can print the whole value. Conversely, if the mask returns a one, we uh, shift back to left and we uh, or one on the, the first bit, and again, we prepare for the next bit coming in. So here we store that byte because these operations actually change our byte intermediately for every eight bits, right? So we store it every eight bits until we have eight bits done, then we can actually print it. So here we increment Y. If it is now eight, we know that we had already had eight bits processed so then we can actually uh, show it and we need to reset it so if it is already eight then we uh, jump to the reset y and otherwise we store y for the next decay because we still not had eight bits and here we have the reset y which uh, loads the random byte now in x which is important and we set a to zero that's also important because we use this kernel routine to actually print XA as a 16-bit integer. 
and x is the uh, lowest part of that 16-bit value. Hence, I load it into x and not into a. And then we print a space or a cursor right for the next number to show. We reset y to 0, so we can again count from 0 to 7 to have all the bits set. And uh, we also set the random byte immediately to 0, as well as the y. And then we basically wait for the next uh, decay. And that is basically it. It's really that simple. So there you have it. We hacked a really cheap Kaige counter, 45 euros. I now understand why it's so cheap. Because the tube is tiny. We all like to have big tubes. Especially in radioactive uh, detection equipment. So we hacked it to actually get the signal from the LED into our little uh, transistor switch circuit that will pull down low the flag pin on the user port which generates an interrupt and when that interrupt happens we check the lowest nibble of a free running counter of the CIA and if it's a zero we shift in the zero if it's a one we shift in the one and we do that eight times and we have a random number between zero and 255 it's that simple so yeah, we've got a true random number generator. And I'm still alive and kicking. Knock on wood. So I hope you learned something and see you in the next one.